We're excited to have Runa Sandvik as our keynote speaker today. Uh, Runa is the founder of Granite, where she's focused on the incredibly hard and important problem of cybersecurity for journalists and at-risk people around the world. Her work builds on upon experience from her time at the New York Times, Freedom of the Press Foundation, and the Tor Project. Runa is also already part of the attack community. I've had the pleasure of working with Runa as a contributor to attack, and we actually cite her work in multiple techniques in the framework. Please welcome to the stage our attack 4.0 keynote, Runa Sandvik. Thank you. Good morning. And thank you to Adam and the organizers for inviting me to, uh, for coming this morning. Happy birthday to attack. I wanted to spend a bit of time talking about civil society, Pegasus, and Predator, and what sophisticated spyware means for us as defenders. Um, the slide deck does have um, a bunch of links in it. I'll find a way to share it online after, after the talk. So um, first things first, um, hi. Um, originally from Oslo, currently based in New York City. I have a very cute cat named Pumpkin that I uh, spent some time training during the pandemic, so she knows a bunch of um, fun tricks. I started scuba diving my year ago, which I feel like if you spend some any time with um, Adam, you'll probably end up doing as well. Uh, took a course in free diving a couple of weeks ago, which was a whole lot of fun, and I'll be doing again in December. Um, back in 2015, I hacked a Wi-Fi enabled uh, spark rifle, but outside of the type of work that I'm doing now, um, I also analyzed Queen Lambert for uh, OSX in 2021, and I write a newsletter about journalists and spies. But work-wise, um, back in the day, 2009, I worked for the Tor Project, then spent um, a bit of time with Freedom of the Press Foundation. I was with the New York Times for three and a half years, reporting into the CISA with being responsible for security in the newsroom, including um, foreign bureaus. Then in late 2019, I left the Times. Pandemic happened shortly after. I spent some time doing consulting work. Um, it's a very similar reign, cybersecurity for uh, journalists, at-risk people, and then last summer I figured this is this is what I do. This is what I want to be doing moving forward. Um, I can't imagine really taking on any uh, any other type of role. And so I founded Granite to continue doing that type of work, and that is what I'm doing today. I also support CISA's Cybersecurity Advisory Committee, and I am a member of the Aspen Institute's Global Cybersecurity Group. So when I talk about security for um, civil society, what does that actually entail? So when I think about then the, the sort of groups of people or the individuals that I work with, these are sort of some of the, the themes that, that pop up. The work that they're doing is more than just a nine to five. The type of work is often product focused and deadline driven. So just to give an example of that, if you're a journalist with the New York Times, you are a journalist 24 seven. You're not just a journalist between the hours of nine and five. The work that you're doing extends beyond corporate systems and corporate accounts and corporate assets. You are a journalist on social media as well. For example, um, your work is the articles that you write and the reporting that you do. And part of that reporting process is very deadline driven. You want to be out there with the scoops, with the latest takes. You want to be first in many cases. The people in the organizations that I work with are also under-resourced, meaning they have to do a lot with a little, and that unfortunately also includes um, cybersecurity. They don't necessarily have 
dedicated support. Uh, maybe they have one IT person who has to do a lot. Maybe they have a part-time IT person, or sometimes they have a contractor that can come in and help them, but they don't have a big, big um, security team. There's a lot of high expectations associated with the work that civil society is doing, which I also think that you just find in mission-oriented uh, work. There's limited support, there's limited funding. Um, they're dealing with common threats as well as advanced sectors. There's a lot going on for the people that are working in this space. Now, earlier this year, um, CISA announced a high-risk community protection initiative. And um, earlier this month, um, the advisory group presented to CISA a report um, about what CISA can and should do to better support high-risk communities. Um, and that report defines, um, or rather repeats, CISA's definition for a high-risk community, which really comes down to these are organizations facing advanced persistent threats. They're doing so with limited support or limited funding, limited capacity to provide for their own defense, and they're receiving uh, limited or no support from the U.S. government. So you see that already within the definition that CISA is using, um, it does sort of fit into the, um, the, the themes that I pointed out for civil society. Now, my approach to this is I think about securing not just corporate assets or online accounts or personal devices, but I think about it in terms of securing identities. I mentioned you're a journalist 24 seven, not just nine to five. I then think about that as needing to secure the identity, the person, meaning we need to take into account not just corporate assets, corporate laptops, corporate phones, but personal accounts, personal devices, but also how the individual is actually working, the level of um, technical knowledge that they have, the systems that they're comfortable with. You really need to account for all of these pieces to be able to talk about um, a person working securely. I also apply a holistic focus to the work that I do. So for me, I often say that it is my job to help you do your job safely. And safely for a person means not just safely digitally, but we have to look at digital, physical, emotional, and legal. I can help you be secure from a digital perspective, but you may still then encounter threats in the physical world, emotionally and legally, that also do impact the digital assets that you have. And so I think that by focusing on all four for an individual, for a person, I think we're going to get a lot further in helping people work safely. I think it's also really, really important to have usable solutions, right? I think from a pure technical standpoint, there's a lot of really, really cool nifty systems and techniques and uh, configurations that, that you can use to do something um, in a secure way. Like Cubes, for me, is a really interesting operating system. But if the individual is not familiar with that type of system, they're not necessarily going to be able to use it in a day-to-day -day setting. Thinking back to what I said about their work being product-driven um, and sort of deadline-driven deadline, deadline -driven and product-focused, you really also do need to provide them with usable solutions for the work that they're doing. And also, finally, proactive advice. I think if we wait until someone has been compromised with giving them the guidance that would help them prevent or defend against that type of attack, you're already too late. If you wait until they come and ask you for it, you're sort of doing them a disservice if you already know that this is something that they could benefit from. So finding that right balance between giving them the type of guidance that they need in advance without flooding them with 
all the possible mitigations, all the possible knowledge and information that you have, I think becomes key. So that is really high level how I uh, approach my work and the people that, um, for, for the people that I work with. Now, also over the past year and, I want to say a year and a half, um, I started mapping, um, mapping victims of sophisticated spyware like Kandira, Pegasus, and Predator um, to what is now a set of uh, public spreadsheets. Um, and this is sort of just some of the fields that I'm working with where I'm keeping track of like the name of the victim, the role that the victim has, like are they a journalist, a politician, an activist, um, the year the attack took place, if it's successful, if it was just attempted but not necessarily successful, the device. And I'm hoping that over time, this will help us say something about the groups of people who are targeted by which operator, what year, with what kind of exploit, and also see the evolution of the attack vectors that the operators are using. So the Kandiru and Predator data sets are up to date. Uh, Pegasus is the one that I'm working on now, which is going to take, uh, take a bit longer. But I wanted to share that as well. So, you know, I've spent a lot of time reading reports by Citizen Lab and Amnesty and uh, Cisco Talos and Google Tag. And the one thing that I think consistently stands out is that research into sophisticated spyware is, is really, really hard. Um, I think the, I think it's clear that the detection of attacks is more complex. The spyware is more complex. The devices, rather the systems that we need to do um, forensic analysis on are more complex, the type of malware that we're dealing with is more complex. All in all, making this type of research really hard. Both Citizen Lab and Amnesty have said that Android is more difficult to forensically analyze and that iOS does have more forensic traces accessible. In a post by Cisco Talis about Predator from, I think, 2021, so it says that uh, at that point in time, they just didn't have access to all the components of the spyware, which is something that Amnesty and Citizen Lab have said as well, which again, limits the analysis that they can do. And there's also been over the years, right? Citizen Lab published the first report on Pegasus back in 2016. So over the years, there's also been then an increase in false dubious or misleading claims, both from the spyware makers, so in Alexa and NSO group, from the operators, Egypt, Morocco, Greece, Spain, pro-government supporters, and other individuals as well. And I think all in all, this makes it really, really tricky, both for us as defenders, but also especially for the victims that are targeted by these types of attacks. And so I wanted to try and like map some of Pegasus and Predator to the attack framework, um, just to give you an idea of what we know about um, the, those two um, spyware today, um, and just give you a sense of what that might look like. For people who are watching this who are maybe not too familiar with attack, it's basically a knowledge base of adversary tactics and techniques. Um, it means that we can take all the research that's been shared online about Pegasus and Predator to date, and we can start asking questions like, what do we know about how Predator gains access to a device? What do we know about how Pegasus maintains persistence? How have those two evolved over time? And we can then leverage all that knowledge for defensive measures. And I think in this context, it's important to also consider that defensive measures can certainly be a tactical measure, it can be something that we can implement on the phone, it can be something that we can um, look for on the network, but it can also be something that is purely captured in the guidance that we give to the people who are at risk. And I'll get back to that point later on. But in mapping 
in sort of sitting down to like do some of this mapping, I ran into a few limitations. I found that number one, mobile matrix is just not as developed as enterprise. Like there aren't any um, entries for reconnaissance or resource development. Um, I found that there's really no like currently, I think, good setup for mapping commercial spyware in cases where you have a vendor, commercial vendor creating software that is then used by an operator. So in this case, you know, in Alexa creates Predator that is used by Egypt, and so group creates Pegasus that is used by Mexico. And also the language that attack uses for the adversary, I think slightly breaks in this context as well. Because in this case, depending on the tactic or the technique that you're looking at, the adversary can be either the vendor or the operator. And in the specific case, I, so both of them then become the adversary and both of them do react to reports that are published by security researchers. The vendor will read the reports and make changes to the spyware or the infrastructure that is used by the spyware. The operator may also then make changes to the infrastructure or um, make public statements or launch some sort of disinformation campaign or even go as far as changing the laws in the country to try and um, uh, navigate away from um, the public backlash, put it that way. Um, and so if we jump in and then look at reconnaissance, so the adversary is trying to gather information they can use to plan future op operations. So back in 2016, when Citizen Lab published the first reports on Pegasus, that was a case of um, an individual receiving um, SMS messages with a link. And that's sort of been one um, fairly consistent um, attack vector that we've seen over the years. And here's like just one, one example. When back in June 2018, um, Saudi Arabia targeted um, New York Times reporter Ben Hubbard with um, a few different SMS messages. And so in this case, um, they sort of trying to make it a bit personal, try to make it a bit targeted, try to like send something that would be interesting to him um, to lead him into clicking on the link. But we've also then seen um, how the information that is um, gathered about the individual has been a bit more sophisticated than just trying to figure out if like, hey, would this person be interested in covering a protest? So earlier this year, the New York Times reported that a US Greek national who at the time, this was fall of 2021, worked on Meta's uh, trust and safety team, um, had been placed under a year long wiretap by the Greek National Intelligence Service and also hacked with Predator. And the reporting then showed that in this case, the information gleaned from the wiretap assisted the ruse used to implant the spyware. If you look into the details in the article, you'll find that um, Artemis Seifert had been under this year long wiretap, which had then also seen that she had signed up to receive the um, COVID-19 booster that she had received an SMS confirming her appointment, had then taken that same language, like click here to confirm your appointment and then send another message. But then this time, instead of the legitimate confirm your appointment link, had inserted their own very special one click install predator link. So this is an example of a one click um, attack that is leveraging information that um, was already learned by the intelligence service in a slightly different way. And I also just want to take a moment to just point out that in, in Artemis's case, more than a year after her surveillance by the intelligence service and being infected with Predator for about two months, 
No charges have been brought against her. She's not been asked to cooperate with the authorities on any investigation. She has no recourse whatsoever. In fact, earlier this year, when she testified for the PEGA committee in the European Parliament, she also pointed out that around this time, um, Greece had also changed some laws that further limited the information that surveillance victims could, uh, could obtain from the government about why they were targeted. So in response to um, this weak surveillance scandal, victims can learn even less. And again, they have no recourse, which is really the case for the hundreds of victims that we, we know about. In terms of resource development, right, the adversary is trying to establish resources they can use to support operations. Um, earlier this month, Amnesty International and some other media partners published what's called the Predator Files, showing that um, an operator believed to be in Vietnam had between February and June of this year used social media platforms X and Facebook to publicly target at least 50 accounts belonging to 27 individuals and 23 institutions. I think what's really interesting about this case, and there's, there's a number of different things, I think one in which, um, one is that I don't think that we to date have seen an operator target um, people with Predator in such a public way. To date, it's been one click, zero click, and in the middle, but not, uh, not social media, which tells me that the operator didn't necessarily care about getting caught. They just wanted to put the links out there just to see what would happen. It's also a case where the targeting is not as direct, right? One click or zero click would target the, an individual and their device, but posting a link on social media targets not just the person that you're tweeting at, uh, but anyone who's also reading the thread, which means that the potential set of victims is much, much broader. I think this is also an interesting uh, time to consider whether or not a state targeting um, employees of another government, if that would breach the UN norms of responsible state behavior in cyberspace. So really, really interesting uh, research. Definitely check it out if you haven't read the report already. For initial access, the adversary is trying to get into your network, one click SMS from 2016, which we talked about already. Um, then in late 2020 was when Citizen Lab first reported on um, a zero click exploit, um, this one called Kismet in iMessage. What's Interesting here is that in, in the initial 2016 report, Citizen Lab noted that a 2013 brochure for Pegasus noted the capability of zero, uh, a zero click exploit. So it was documented by um, NSO Group as a capability for Pegasus in 2013, which was written about by Citizen Lab in 2016, and it took until late 2020 for, for Citizen Lab to come out and say that that summer they had seen a zero click exploit in the wild. And that is now, I think, something that we hear about quite often. I, I think that um, most of the sort of more recent reports by Citizen Lab do refer to zero click exploits. But we've also seen a couple of cases of uh, man in the middle being used to, to install both uh, Pegasus and also Predator. So this is from a September 2023 report by Citizen Lab talking about a aspiring presidential candidate um, in Egypt that uh, had been targeted with network injection. So in Egypt, using the Vodafone mobile network, um, would be automatically pointed to a website to infect his phone with Predator. 
Um, if I remember correctly, in I think 2021, um, Amnesty International wrote a report about uh, an operator in Morocco using uh, network injection to uh, target individuals with pe Pegasus. So it's a technique that we've seen used by both um, Pegasus and Predator. So that's one click, zero click, network injection. And then finally, um, physical access plus one click. So back, if you remember the Pegasus project back in the summer of 2021, as part of that, the Washington Post in December that year wrote this article about how Jamal Khashoggi's uh, then fiance had been infected with Pegasus. So she had been targeted with one click messages and just never clicked. The operator was sort of fairly persistent and she just did not click. Um, so they had to find a different way to infect her device. What they ended up doing was when she landed at the airport, she was then detained, had to surrender her to Android phones, laptop, and passwords. And one of the agents then took her phone. They had physical access. The device was unlocked, opened the browser, and went to their like special like Pegasus infection link uh, to infect her phone with Pegasus. So again, here we have an example of physical access plus uh, one click to, uh, to gain access to the device. We don't know a whole lot about persistence, but there's been sort of two pieces that have been written about um, over the last few years about both Pegasus and Predator. Uh, back in 2016, which was I think pretty pretty early, shortly after the first report by uh, Citizen Lab, that um, Pegasus to maintain persistence would disable Apple's automatic updates. And I remember back then when this report came out, the sort of guidance to people, because every time a report comes out, people are like, well, what do I do? How do I know? How do I check? How do I avoid this thing? Back then, after this report came out, the guidance fairly quickly became um, check to see if your device is running the latest version of the operating system and make sure that what you're seeing as the latest version actually is the latest version. That was a way to check for did something on your system disable automatic updates. For Predator, um, Citizen Lab had also noted that uh, Predator persists after reboot using the iOS automations feature. Um, and if I remember correctly, it turns off some bits and pieces so as to not notify the individual that there's something um, on their device. Um, I think that when Cisco Talus wrote about Predator, I don't think that they were able to document anything in the way of persistence though. So we don't know, like I said, we don't know a whole lot um, about how that's been done historically or um, how that's done to date, um, short of these two, these two pieces. So, you know, based on the information that, that we've seen so far, what advice can we give? What can we learn from the different ways in which that Pegasus and Predator have targeted individuals to date? How can we leverage that for advice? Well, between 2016 and um, 2022, so late last year, this was sort of the, the guidance. Number one, don't click on links from strangers. Uh, Maybe considered sort of good, succinct advice, but if you think about a journalist, that guidance sort of breaks in that context. Because a journalist's job is to click from links from strangers. That is how they receive tips from the public. Our job is to make that safe for them to do. So certainly saying don't click on links from strangers doesn't really work. And look at what happened to Artemis Seifert. She received a link that looked correct in that context of getting the COVID-19 booster. Make sure you update your phone. We do know that running the latest version of um, any piece of software includes security fixes, not just new features and new emojis, generally good advice. 
reboot your phone once a day. It is believed that doing so would um, wipe out any active infection and would cause the operator to have to reinfect you, which then makes it maybe more difficult for them, certainly adds more friction, may also be more expensive depending on how the uh, vendor has structured their agreement. And yeah. so for the longest time, this was sort of the guidance that, that we had. Um, now, following Apple's lockdown mode on um, iOS, certainly I think the number one piece of guidance that I give today. So Apple took years of research into how spyware gets onto iPhones and came up with a optional mode called lockdown mode that you can enable for your device that makes it harder for Pegasus and predators and similar types of spyware to get onto your device. I am not aware of any of any compromise of a device using lockdown mode today. And I'll also say lockdown mode can also run on uh, Mac OS and iPad, o oh, iPad OS. It is the best defense that we have today for Pegasus and, Pre and Predator. But still, uh, the guidance is sort of like, eh, and especially if you're running Android, you don't have lockdown mode. You're sort of back to what the guidance was before. Maybe, maybe the current latest update uh, prevents the spyware, right? So, well, who gives advice, right? Citizen Lab gives advice. Amnesty International gives advice. I give advice. But also, you do. Now, I watched Selena Larson's keynote from last year, um, where she talked about report writing and the importance of detailing the findings that matter to your stakeholders, bottom line up front, being succinct, making sure that you include relevant information in the report, that you write in a way that is um, easy to understand for your audience, and that you really consider who your audience is and how your report will be used. If you haven't had a chance to watch it, or if it's been a year, I highly re recommend that you go back and watch it one more time. I think it is a really, really good talk. But, you know, if we go back to the definition of a high risk community, um, we have individuals and organizations that are targeted by advanced actors. They have limited capabilities, they're under resourced, they don't necessarily have the support or the funding to provide a good defense for themselves and for their organization. I think in many cases, thinking about what Selena said about report writing, if you're in a big organization, it may be that you write a report that researchers or analysts elsewhere, they take that report, they read it, and then they figure out for themselves, what do my executives need to know? What do we need to know as the analysts on this team? How do we translate what's in this report to IT or infrastructure? What do we look for on the endpoints? What do we look for in, on the network? What do we block? These groups, these high-risk individual civil society groups don't have those analysts, those researchers, or those teams. That's you. So when you're writing a report that includes information about attacks on civil society, you really need to consider them your audience as well. So I remember back in like 2016, 2017, when I started reading all of these reports from, from Citizen Lab, and like, honestly, my, my first take was like, this is a really long report. There's a lot of information here. There's the information about the victim. There's a bunch of historical stuff. There's a bunch of political stuff. There's like all of these things that to me just seem like too much. I was really interested in the 
technical bits, the technical nitty gritty stuff, there was just a whole lot of information there. But over the years, I sort of come to see that that is by design. So in those reports, and I think in a lot of the reports that people write in general, you'll sort of find um, answers to, if not all, then most of these questions here, like who's the victim? What happened? How did it happen? Where did it happen? Who attacked them? And what's your advice? And the reason why the reports from Amnesty and from Citizen Lab are so long and contain so much different information is that they're writing for multiple audiences at the same time. They're not just writing for a technical audience. So a researcher may just be interested in, well, what happened and how did it happen? An analyst may also want to know, what is your advice? For the thing that just happened here that you just told me about, what do I need to know? What, what am I going to take away from reading this report? And a lawyer may be interested in every single piece of this report. Who's the victim? What happened? How did it happen? Where and who? And what is your advice? And if you have anything else that you can tell them, I'm sure that they will want to hear that as well. They are writing for every single type of audience that you can think of. And well, that is a lot. But also, Sophisticated Spyware really adds that complexity because as I mentioned before, when we like mapped parts of Pegasus and Predator to the attack framework, sure, there may be some technical uh, measures that we can put in place to try to defend against this type of threat. But in some cases, that defensive measure is going to come down to the, the guidance that we can give. And in these cases, the stakeholders for that type of guidance include advisors, analysts, researchers, lawyers, civil society. When I read these reports, I try to figure out not just what are the technical bits that I need to understand, what is the information that I want to pull out to put into my spreadsheets, but also for the people that I'm working with, what is it that I need now to be able to take in and translate to them and ensure that they understand and include any sort of defensive measure that they should take as well. So to build on Selena's keynote from last year, here's what I want to add on. That yes, you should detail the findings that matter to your stakeholder. You should be aware of your entire audience. It is easy to sort of say that my immediate audience is the analysts and the security researchers, the sort of technical audience. But that's not necessarily your entire audience. You can certainly direct different readers with boxes and headlines and colors and maybe find a way to make, make that um, part of the template that you use for writing reports. Um, I, was, I was thinking of who, who told me this um, years ago. It might have been AD, but in reading a report multiple times, right? you can use different colors to highlight different pieces of information to sort of take away depending on the audience that you need to translate it to. You can use different um, boxes and headlines and colors to guide different readers throughout the report as well. I will go as far as saying that reports on attacks against civil society must have advice. Over the past few years, I have read reports that sort of start out by like detailing uh, this like report analyzes some attack or some exploit or some piece of malware. For uh, that targeted uh, journalists in this region and NGOs in this region and maybe a politician over here. And then you scroll to the bottom and there's not a single piece of guidance for them. I think at that point you are doing those <coughs> communities a huge disservice because surely you do have some guidance to give. I'll also say that you should absolutely include mitigations by other vendors. I have read. Um, reports, some by big tech companies, writing about attacks on civil society, specifically writing about Pegasus and Predator, where the if there is guidance, if there is any sort of mitigation listed in the report, um, either there's nothing there, or it's only what 
that specific vendor can provide, which when you're talking about mobile spyware, you should at the very least include Apple's locked in. And if you don't, I uh, do really worry that you are doing those communities a huge. So all in all, find ways to also consider civil society part of the readers of the reports that you write. And that was all that I had for you today. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'll be around the conference if you have any questions. I don't know about you folks, but I just set a daily reminder that you restart my phone every day. Thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, Android does not have a lockdown mode, but I'll do the shrug and do what we can. Um, just want to, on behalf of everyone, thank you so much. Such a interesting but high impact problem. You outlined that perfectly, but also exactly to your point, gave us action um, that we can act on and help. So thank you for that, as well as everything you do for the community. Awesome. Um, just a quick note, we're not doing questions right now, but Runa will be joining Cat at the couch uh, during our break. Small token of our appreciation, of Thanks. course, and give Pumpkin our regards. Thank you so much. <laughs> I will. Thank you. I love that it's matching your shoes. Is, is that is that by design? I love, design. <laughs> Nothing I love it. I love it. Thank you. So with that, uh, join me in welcoming Adam back to the stage for the state of attack. Okay.